Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, to today's uh, talk for the Path Forward for American Democracy. Uh, I am uh, Mark Mao, uh, class of 04. Um, I'm your uh, president for the San Francisco chapter. I'm the regional uh, managing partner of our board for Lexner. And I just wanted to welcome you uh, today and uh, really thankful for all of your participation here today. So just a couple of logistical notes before we start and um, you know, go on to the Dean, uh, which is that uh, we, uh, you, you can note in the chat that there will probably be a couple of events uh, of upcoming uh, alumni events uh, coming up uh, that you can see in the queue in the chat. Um, any questions that you may have, please put it into the chat as well. And uh, you know, don't uh, otherwise <laughs> try to interrupt the talk. Uh, but besides, uh, you know, all of that, we're in the future, we're going to be asking for more alumni participation uh, for a potential leadership committee uh, for the San Francisco chapter. So with that, I will turn that over to the Dean. And again, thank you all very much for participating. And we hope that uh, uh, today will be insightful. Thank you, Mark. And thank you all for coming today. I hope this finds you and all of your loved ones healthy and doing well at this difficult time. I'm going to actually give two different talks but then leave lots of time for questions. First, I was asked to talk a little bit about the state of the law school. And then second, I wanna talk about the future of American democracy, including what's going on right now in Washington, DC. Let me start by talking about the law school. We're entirely online in our classes this year. The campus continues to be closed by Alameda County and Berkeley City orders. We had made the decision for the campus even, that for reasons of public health and also education of our students, it was needed to be online. And that was true in the fall and it's true this semester. The good news is that I think we succeeded in continuing to provide an excellent legal education to our students. We're providing all of the exact same classes as we're in the building. It's interesting in terms of student evaluations, they're even stronger than they usually are. Our median evaluation most semesters for other than seminars is about 6.01. For the fall semester, it was 6.10. And so it shows a degree of student satisfaction with the classes. We're continuing to hold all of the programs and symposia and events that we always do. We have 90 student organizations and they're as active as always. But I don't wanna sugarcoat this either. Being online isn't the same as being in the classroom together. Some of our students are really struggling. Some of them have had to deal with COVID or have had family members who've had to deal with COVID. Some don't have places with stable internet connections or places to study. It's isolating to go to law school, especially for our 1Ls over Zoom. They haven't met each other. They haven't been in the building yet. Also, especially our faculty and staff with young children and young school age children are struggling. It's hard for them to do their full-time jobs while also doing homeschooling. I continue to have concerns about how do we foster community at a time where we're all kept separate by the pandemic. I hear from the students, they'd like us to do more to foster community, but they don't want us to do more Zoom events. And there's obviously a tension at this point in time. I'm very hopeful that by August we'll be back to normal or some semblance of normal. Obviously that all depends on how quickly the vaccine gets rolled out, how quickly our society reaches herd immunity. I'm constantly asked by students, faculty and staff, what we're gonna be doing in the fall in terms of instruction. And I say, I just don't know that we need to decide early enough that everyone can plan, but I wanna wait long enough to really have a good sense of the public health situation and what's possible. Let me share with you some other good news and then some more sobering news. In terms of good news, 96% of our students who took the California bar in October of 2020 passed. That's 96% of our JD students who were first time takers passed. That is, I think the highest in the history of the law school or at least the modern history of the law school. We were equally successful on the New York bar where 26 of 27 of our JD students took the bar passed. Um, it's a wonderful reflection of the hard work and ability of our students. 
as you all know, there was great uncertainty surrounding the bar. It was unclear when it would be held. It was unclear how it would be held, but these students persevered. And I'm just thrilled that we had a 96% first time pass rate. Another piece of good news is that our applications for next year's JD program are way up. Last year, we received about 5,500 applications for the expected 320 slots. This year, we will be well over 8,000 applications for the 320 slots. Now, nationally, there's an increase in applications by about 20, 25%. Our increase is far greater than that. I think it's a tribute to Berkeley Law School that it's such a great increase. I know it's a burden on Kristen Theus Alvarez and the admissions team to go through all the files, but I think it also means that the class of 2024 is gonna be very special. All of the markers indicate that it's gonna be a terrific class. We continue to increase the diversity of our class. My first year here, there were only 12 African-American students in the first year class. Thanks especially to the help of our alumni in recruiting students, that went up to 28 African-American students in my second year here, 33 African-American students in my third year here, and 43 African-American students in every class this year. We've also dramatically increased the number of Native American students, increased the number of Latinx students as well. And I'm very hopeful that next year we will also again increase the median LSAT and median GPA of the entering class, something we've also done during my short time here. Despite the pandemic and despite all of the difficult poses, we continue to add new faculty. We had two new faculty join us this year, Assad Rahim and Chris Huffnagel. And we've got a couple of offers outstanding for next year and the faculty meeting next Wednesday and the Wednesday after. Consider other offers for next year for faculty. Um, we've added 17 new faculty since 2017. And by my count, we still have about 10 slots to fill. And so it's really a dramatic ability to shape the faculty for the future. And the people who were getting both lateral hires from other law schools and entry level hires are just terrific. Finally, by way of good news, there's some wonderful news with regard to our development efforts. Yesterday, it was publicly announced that we received a $10 million gift from the Helen Diller Foundation to name the Institute for Jewish Law and Israeli Studies. Ken Bamberg on our faculty is the co-chair of it. I don't know that this is the largest single gift that Berkeley Law has received, but it's certainly gotta be among them. In December, we announced a wonderful $1 million gift from Matt, Lisa, Sincini to help with scholarships with students. We had a million and a half dollar bequest gift that we were able to talk about from an anonymous donor. So despite the pandemic, we're continuing to just have such wonderful support from alumni and from the community. Um, Mary Matheron and the development team tell me that we're overall a bit ahead of last year at this time. Um, so we're holding our own. We still need to do much better, but um, these are just wonderful gifts and they show such support and confidence in Berkeley Law. So that's my good news. Now I'll tell you the hard news. It's a really tough financial year for the campus and for the law school. The campus estimates it's going to have about $150 million deficit when all is said and done at the end of this fiscal year. For the law school, we're also running a deficit, but thankfully a much smaller deficit than that, but we are running a deficit that's in seven figures this year. Let me try and explain why. Um, we're so fortunate to have a terrific LLM program that brings international students throughout the world to Berkeley. But being all online, fewer students have wanted to enroll in the LLM program. And so a year ago, if you combined all of the tracks of the LLM program, we had 390 students. This year we have, if you combine all the tracks, 140 students. To put that in dollars and cents, it's $9 million less revenue this year from the LLM program than we had a year ago. Our total budget is about 117 million. 
So a loss of 9 million from that is significant. At the same time, campus cut our funding by $2.5 million. We now get less than 5% of all of our money from the state or the campus. Um, campus cut funding to every school on campus to help it deal with its deficit. And for us, it was 2.5 million. And we get a small amount of money from the Office of the President for our public interest programs. Last year, it was $1.8 million. They cut this year to $1.3 million. If you did the quick arithmetic, you saw that for us then, it was a loss of $12 million in revenue this year. We've made up some of that. We expanded our JD class a bit and that gave us a million dollars of additional revenue. At the same time, we've obviously cut travel expenses. We've cut food in the building since we're not together. We've left some staff positions unfilled. Um, but it still leaves us with a, a deficit of as much as $3 million this year. Thankfully, we have cash reserves. We've been planning to use them to build a construction project. You might remember on top of the main law building, that's where the library stacks used to be. And they've been empty since 2012, when the library moved to the new building. And we were gonna spend $20 million to convert them to 15,000 square feet of usable space. We're desperate for additional space. But at the beginning of last March, I put that project on hold. It had been scheduled to start on May 18th and be done by the fall of 2021. And I was very worried. And the good news is that because we didn't do that, we do have the reserves. I said that in the beginning, my commitment during this difficult financial time is to preserve our educational program. As I mentioned, we've not cut a single class or lecture. We've not changed our instructional program at all. We've not changed anything in student services. And second, I wanna protect our staff. We have terrific staff and we're not gonna have any layoffs. We haven't needed to lay off any staff and I wanna preserve everyone's jobs. But it is a hard financial time. And now more than ever, we really need the financial support from our alumni. So that's my report on the state of the law school in question and answers. I'm glad to answer any questions you have about any of this. But I was also asked to talk about American democracy. And I wanna make three points in discussing this. First, the guardrails of American democracy held, but just barely. We can't sugarcoat this. American democracy faced its most significant challenge at any time, at least other than the Civil War, by some accounts, maybe any time in American history. Never before had an incumbent president who lost a reelection bid tried to subvert the results of the election to stay in office. In 1800, John Adams, the incumbent president, lost his bid for reelection. He left office without complaint or protest. Long before the events of 2020, I said to my students that that was a remarkable moment in American history. We all know from world history, so many times when those who are in power refused to relinquish it. From John Adams doing that in 1800, to when George H.W. Bush lost his reelection bid in 1992, every presidential, every president who was denied reelection left office. And they all did so with remarkable graciousness. Never before had we seen what observed from November 3rd through January 6th. And I'm focusing here on an incumbent president trying to retain powers of the office, but never before have we seen in American history a losing candidate try to subvert the election. Think about it. 61 lawsuits were filed around the country trying to overturn the results in particular states. At the same time, pressure was put on elected officials in states like Georgia, in Michigan, to deny the results of the popular vote. The President of the United States told the Georgia Secretary of State, just find me 11,000 votes. 
the President of the United States pressured the Republican members of the Michigan Canvassy Board to not certify the election. Pressure was put on Republican state legislators to deny the outcome of the popular election. They were even brought to Washington, such as the Pennsylvania legislators and the Michigan legislators to convince them. Pressure was put on members of Congress to not certify the election. And pressure was put on the Vice President of the United States to exercise a power that he doesn't possess under the Constitution, to refuse to certify the election. And I have just, in a few minutes, recited some of what we all observed. I think we as lawyers almost take a moment to admire the courage of the judges and the lawyers and the election officials who stood up to this pressure. Let me focus on the judges. Democrat and Republican judges, state and federal, all ruled against the claims of election fraud. I said 61 lawsuits were filed. In 60 of them, President Trump and his supporters lost. The only one they prevailed was about allowing observers for the count of the vote, not about election fraud in any way. If you haven't read it, I'd especially commend to you a decision of the Third Circuit concerning the Pennsylvania vote. It was written by a judge on the Third Circuit who had been appointed the position by President Trump and Judge Stephen Bebos, and a law professor at the University of Pennsylvania. He's unquestionably very conservative. And yet he wrote an emphatic opinion saying that there was no evidence of election fraud in Pennsylvania and that should be expected that before a challenge would come to court, there would be much more in the way of evidence than the none that existed in that case. We had to take a moment to admire the election officials, like the ones I mentioned in Georgia and in Michigan, who withstood the pressure, who followed their constitutional duty, who followed in awarding the electoral votes, the popular votes in that state. We should take a moment to admire the state legislators like the Republicans in Pennsylvania, in Wisconsin, in Michigan, who didn't cave to the pressure and said that their state had to accord the electoral vote to the candidate that won the popular vote. And we must praise Vice President Pence. None of us can imagine the pressure he must have felt from President Trump to, as Vice President, deem Trump the winner. But Vice President Pence said he had no such discretion and he stood for the Constitution. So in the end, as I said, all of this meant that the guardrails of democracy held. But it's so easy to imagine it coming out differently. What if the election in some of these states was even closer than it was? Remember in Florida, it was less than 500 votes in 2000 that separated Bush and Gore. What if there had been evidence of election fraud in some states? What if there had been evidence of Russian meddling in the election? What might have happened? What if some of these individuals hadn't been so courageous? The second topic I wanted to talk about is the impeachment proceeding going on in Washington, D.C. As I said to the students in my constitutional law class just yesterday, this is only the fourth time in American history that the Senate has met to decide whether or not to convict a president who's been impeached. Now, there are two major constitutional issues that are before the Senate. One is whether the Senate can try somebody after they've already left office. The Constitution is silent about this. The Constitution says that the president, the vice president, and all civil officers can be impeached and removed for treason, bribery, or high crimes and misdemeanors. It also says that if the president has been impeached by the House, the trial in the Senate presided over by the Chief Justice. Some who I respect interpret that language as saying that you can only impeach and have a trial of the president while in office. But I think that there are even stronger arguments on the other side. History supports the argument on the other side. The concept of impeachment, like so much of American law, comes from English law. 
And there are very famous examples in England of individuals being impeached and convicted after having left office. John Adams in 1800 explicitly said that a president could be impeached and convicted after leaving office. When Ulysses Grant was the president, William Belknap was the Secretary of War. He was accused of corruption. He resigned from office. After that, the House of Representatives voted to impeach him and he was tried in the Senate. Yesterday, 56 senators voted that a president could be tried after leaving office. I think there's a strong policy argument for this. And it was made yesterday in the Senate. Imagine a president engages in treason, bribery, high crimes, and misdemeanor near the end of the presidency. Can the president avoid responsibility in that way? And even though Donald Trump is out of office, there still could be a consequence to conviction, disqualification from future office. I've been asked a number of times the last couple of days, could Trump go to court and challenge the decision of the Senate yesterday? And the answer is clearly no. In 1993, in Nixon versus the United States, the Supreme Court said the challenges to the impeachment removal process are non-justiciable political questions. That case involved Walter Nixon, a federal judge in Mississippi who had been impeached by the House of Representatives. When the matter went to the Senate for a trial, they formed a committee to the evidence against him and make recommendations to the entire body. Nixon objected to this and said the whole Senate should have to sit and try him. The Supreme Court unanimously ruled against Walter Nixon and said the procedures for impeachment, the decision by, about impeachment, are left entirely to Congress and the courts won't get involved. There is a second constitutional issue. It's the focus of what's going on right now in the Senate. Was President Trump's speech on January 6th protected by the First Amendment? The primary defense by President Trump's lawyers is that he was exercising free speech. A president has speech like anybody else, and he shouldn't be able to be convicted for speech protected by the First Amendment. Now, at the outset, it's important to recognize this isn't a criminal trial. It's not that the House managers have to prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. And the Constitution allows for impeachment for high crimes and misdemeanors. I think the overwhelming weight of authority says that does not require a criminal act. An abuse of power is a high crime and misdemeanor. But on the merits, the question is, was President Trump's speech incitement of illegal activity that's not protected by the First Amendment? Or should it be regarded as not meeting the test for incitement? So it should be thought of as constitutionally protected. The test for incitement was articulated by the Supreme Court in 1969 in Brandenburg versus Ohio. And if you took First Amendment law at Berkeley at any time after that, you surely read Brandenburg. There the Supreme Court said that speech can be punished as incitement if there's a likelihood of imminent illegal activity and if the speech is directed at causing imminent illegal activity. Think about those two requirements. Was there a likelihood of imminent illegal activity? I think anyone who looks at the evidence would have to say that it was predictable that violence could erupt. For two months, President Trump and his followers said that there had been fraud in the election, even though there's no evidence of this. They kept saying, stop the steal. When one looks at how they were rallied to come to that protest in Washington, you see evidence of the likelihood of illegal activity. President Trump sending a tweet saying, be there, it will be wild. What was going on on the internet in gathering people to come there. But you can also look at the other things that were said on the platform on January 6th. Rudy Giuliani saying, we needed to have, quote, trial by combat, which certainly implies some form of 
violence, we don't think of just words, is combat. And then there's the question of was President Trump's speech directed at causing imminent illegal activity? This, of course, was much discussed today in the Senate, as they pointed out 20 times President Trump in that speech on January 6th said to the audience, you have to fight. He said to them, you have to fight like hell or you won't have a democracy. You can certainly imagine on the basis of all of this evidence, the Senate, any jury could conclude it meets the Brandenburg test for incitement. But we all know that the result in the Senate is much more likely to be a function of politics than law. And it seems unlikely that there'll be two thirds of the senators who will vote to convict. I've been often asked, do I think it's worth going through the impeachment in the trial in light of the political reality? I think so. I think that the marshalling of the evidence as we're seeing in the Senate, the majority vote we're sure to get in the Senate sends a message to the country and it sends a message to the future. I've often said to students that I believe one of the key functions of the criminal law is it's the way the community expresses disapproval for behavior. I think that what the House did and what the Senate will do even without two thirds vote is a way of expressing disapproval. As I said, disapproval within our society now, disapproval for the future. Well, this then brings me to the third and final part of my remarks. What can we do to improve democracy for the future? I think one of the things that this election points out, but that we should also see more generally, is how profoundly anti-democratic the Constitution is with regard to the government it created. Now, I know we pride ourselves in living in a democracy, and yet, imagine a foreign country and imagine we were assessing it with regard to how democratic it is. And imagine it had the following branches of government. It has a president who's chosen not by popular vote, but by the electoral college. Five times in American history and twice in this century, the loser of the popular vote became president. I can't think of any other country that regards itself as a democracy that would have the loser of the popular vote becoming the chief executive of the nation. And it could have happened so easily this year. It wouldn't have taken changing that many votes in a handful of states for Donald Trump to have lost by as much as 7 million votes, but still end up as president. I think I can show that the shifts in the political parties, the way in which the political parties have realigned themselves in such an ideological fashion, with the Republican Party being very conservative, the Democratic Party very liberal, no longer having conservative Democrats or liberal Republicans, increases the likelihood of this happening in the future. Look at the United States Senate. It's two senators for each state regardless of size. This means that senators representing a minority of the population can create a majority in the Senate and therefore be able to thwart the will of the majority of the population. I'll give you an example. In 2018, Brett Kavanaugh was confirmed for a seat on the Supreme Court and the senators who voted for him represented only 44% of the population. But the anti-majoritarian nature of the Senate goes beyond that. Because of Senate rules with regard to the filibuster, except for cabinet nominations and federal judicial nominations, for anything else, it takes 60 votes in order for something to pass the Senate. That's anti-majoritarian. What about the House of Representatives? Well, the House is allocated in terms of seats on the base of population. But in many states, there is partisan gerrymandering where the political party that controls the legislature allocates the seats from that state in the House. Take North Carolina as an example. It's basically a purple state. It went for Obama in 2008. 
Romney in 2012, Trump in 2016, 2020, but always by very close margins. In 2018, I don't have the 2020 statistics yet, Democrats and Republicans got almost equal numbers of votes when it came to seats in the House of Representatives in North Carolina. But because of gerrymandering, Republicans got 10 of the 13 seats and Democrats only three. The Republicans controlled the legislature in North Carolina. They had a computer draw 3,000 different maps for how to have the seats allocated within the state. And they picked the one that maximized the chance of Republicans controlling 10 of 13 seats. And then you've got the Supreme Court and the lower federal courts. They were appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate. I think we could accept one or two anti-democratic features of the federal government. But I think we've got to face that all of these parts of the federal government are terribly anti-democratic. So what are some of the things that we might do about this? One is to add more states, to add District of Columbia and Puerto Rico as states. I can explain why the effect of that would be to counteract some of the anti-majoritarian features of the system. But to me, it's also been about basic fairness. We all learned in some history class that there shouldn't be taxation without representation. And yet those who live in DC or Puerto Rico have exactly that. I think the Supreme Court was wrong in its decision in 2019 in Rucho versus Common Cause that says the challenges to partisan gerrymandering can't be heard in federal court. So we need state courts to find partisan gerrymandering violate state constitutions like occurred in Pennsylvania. We need states like California has done to create independent districting commissions. I think we need to focus on court reform. I have an op-ed that's supposed to come out in tomorrow's New York Times that talks about the importance of Democrats acting to restore balance to the federal judiciary, creating more judgeships. We haven't had an increase in the number of judgeships since 1990. There's been a 50% increase in the caseloads, especially civil cases, but no increase in the judges, even apart from restoring balance. Donald Trump appointed over a quarter of all of the federal judges. And I think one way to offset that as well as to meet the workload of the federal court is to expand the size of the federal judiciary. I would favor term limits for Supreme Court justices. I would favor 18 year non-renewable terms. Thankfully, life expectancy is a lot longer now than it was in 1787. In 1787, the average life expectancy was 36 years old. Clarence Thomas was 43 when he was confirmed for the Supreme Court in 1991. If he remains on the court until he's 90, the age was just as John Paul Stevens retired, Clarence Thomas will be a Supreme Court justice for 47 years. So this doesn't sound partisan. Elena Kagan was 50 when she was confirmed. If she stays until she's 90, that's 40 years. That's too much power in one person's hands for too long a period of time. Amy Coney Barrett is 48 years old. If she stays on the court until she's 87, the age was Justice Ginsburg died, she'll be a justice until 2059. Also, too much depends on the accident of history. Richard Nixon got to pick four Supreme Court justices in his first two years as president. Donald Trump got to pick three justices in his four years as president, but Jimmy Carter got no picks in his four years as president. I find the following statistic very powerful. Since 1960, we've had 32 years with Republican presidents and 28 years with Democratic presidents. In four years in 2024, it'll be exactly 32 years Republican and 32 years Democrat. But since 1960, Republicans have picked 15 justices for the Supreme Court. Democratic presidents picked only eight justices for the Supreme Court, which was a long way to explaining the very conservative court we have today. 18 year non-renewable terms would mean every president could pick a justice every two years. It would lessen the effects of the accident of history 
It would even out the ideological composition of the court. So these are some of the reforms that I would favor to restore democracy, but I don't think we can ignore the ways in which our country is anti-democratic, the ways in which talking about American democracy is much more an appealing myth than a reality. And I think it's the responsibility of our generation to fix that. So I was told to talk until 540, I think we're there. I'm gonna make sure some lights are on in the room. I think it's been getting dark here and I'll be glad then to take any questions you have. Hi, so while Erwin turns on the lights, I'll introduce myself. My name is Whitney Mello, I'm Erwin's assistant and I'll be helping uh, field the questions today. So uh, you can feel free to send them to me via message in the chat. I've already received a few and I'll read them to Erwin now. Or if you'd like to ask your question out loud, you can raise your hand and I'll do my best to call on you. Uh, so Erwin, starting with an impeachment question. Why isn't the Senate conviction vote by secret ballot? It's entirely up to the Senate in that regard. I think the most important thing is that the Senate gets to set the rules of its procedures. Um, there is a provision in the constitution that indicates that votes are supposed to be recorded and so some would say that that would trump the provision that the Senate gets to make the own rules of its proceedings. Thank you. Um, do you see a conflict of interest with Senator Leahy serving as the judge in the impeachment trial? Shouldn't Justice Roberts have taken on the responsibility? The constitution says, if the president of the United States has been impeached and tried in the Senate, the chief justice shall preside. I think Chief Justice Roberts wanted to have nothing to do with this. And then the question was, should Vice President Harris preside? Is the Vice President is the one who presides over the Senate or should it be Senator Leahy? It is a strange role that he is both presiding and a voter. Um, the only thing about it that makes it less so is that the person who presides over an impeachment trial does almost nothing. When Bill Clinton was impeached, Chief Justice William Rehnquist presided. And when it was all done, Rehnquist said, I did virtually nothing, but I did it well. We saw when Chief Justice Roberts presided last January over the first Trump impeachment trial, other than once admonishing the lawyers to be nicer to one another, he didn't really do anything. So I don't think you can analogize Senator Leahy presiding as being the same as a judge in a courtroom. A judge in a courtroom makes all sorts of decisive rulings on motions, even if it's a jury trial. Senator Leahy doesn't make those kind of motions, um, but it is the first time there's ever been an impeachment trial of a president where you didn't have the chief justice presiding over it. Um, I was hoping to hear a mention of the Reapportionment Act as an anti-democratic force. Could the Dean provide his thoughts on the Reapportionment, uh, Reapportionment Act? I think it's important to emphasize that as well to show the pervasiveness of, pervasiveness of anti-democratic pro-rural aspects of the federal government, rather than only highlighting that the Supreme Court, Senate, and presidency as being anti-democratic due to the Senate and the Electoral College. I did talk about malapportionment with regard to the House, though I apologize because it's compressed time, I didn't do so very much. Um, partisan gerrymandering is nothing new. It takes its name from governor of Massachusetts early in American history, Elbridge Geary, who engaged in the practice. What's different now is sophisticated computer programs make it possible to engage in partisan gerrymandering with far more precision than ever before. I mentioned the example of North Carolina, where they had a computer draw 3,000 possible different maps for how to draw the election districts for house seats in North Carolina. They picked the one that maximized Republicans being able to get 10 of 13 seats, and it worked. And of course, if it's a Democratic controlled state legislature, they engage in partisan gerrymandering too. This isn't about one party or the other. Some states, California, Arizona, have gone to independent districting commissions as a solution to partisan gerrymandering. There's a bill in Congress 
that would require independent commissions for drawing congressional districts. Now, I want to emphasize this would not change partisan gerrymandering for state legislative positions or for city councils or county board of supervisors. It would just be for seats in the United States House of Representatives. I mentioned in 2019 in Rucho versus Common Cause, the Supreme Court said that challenges to partisan gerrymandering can't be adjudicated by the federal courts. But Chief Justice Roberts opinion said if Congress wanted to, Congress could require independent district commissions for House seats. A bill has been introduced into the House to do that as part of a number of voting reforms that would be, I think it's called HR1. Um, I worry whether it's gonna get filibustered in the Senate and get killed in that way, but I strongly support that change. Great, thank you. Um, okay, we're receiving a lot of questions, so I wanna let everyone know, uh, I'm just going through them in the order we get them, so we're happy to come back if there's something you ask that's expanding on something Erwin's already said. Um, so your recommendations make sense, but as a practical matter, why would those benefiting from the current system make those changes? Let me put aside the filibuster for a moment and let's talk about the kind of changes that I was suggesting. Add DC and Puerto Rico as states, I think it's widely perceived that that would benefit Democrats and that because of that, it would help offset the Republican advantage in the Electoral College and the Republican advantage in the Senate. I think with a Democratic House and a Democratic Senate and Democratic President, there's a real chance that that could get passed, but for the issue of the filibuster. Um, the bill we were just talking about, and there's many things that should be done to deal with the problem of voter suppression and to strengthen the Voting Rights Act. But one aspect would be to create independent districting commissions for the states. I think again, a House and a Senate apart from the filibuster and a president or all Democrats would be willing to support that. The catch in these, as well as the other things I mentioned is the filibuster that because of the filibuster to adopt legislation, including this legislation, would take 60 votes and there aren't 60 votes in the Senate. Now the Democrats could eliminate the filibuster by majority vote um, if they wanted to do so. The Republicans eliminated the filibuster for Supreme Court nominations. The Democrats earlier eliminated the filibuster for federal district court and court of appeal and cabinet nominations. But at least so far, there are a couple of Democratic senators such as Joe Manchin from West Virginia said they won't vote to eliminate the filibuster. Without that, the ability of Joe Biden to do much through Congress is gonna be quite limited. Great, um, oh, I'm sorry, I lost my spot. How do you imagine that the post-election period might have proceeded if the Republicans controlled the House as well as the Senate? Which reforms do you think the Democrats should pursue to strengthen the guardrails for future electoral college vote certifications? We all saw that the Electoral Count Act from the late 19th century leaves too much uncertain. And I think that now with the events of November 2020, December 2020, January 2020, firmly in mind, I think that the Electoral Count Act should be revised to be much clearer. There are a number of things that can be done. I think it should be made clearer in terms of the states that the winner of the popular vote gets the state's electoral votes. I think that the role of Congress in terms of who the votes they accept or reject should be very limited. It shouldn't be that the Congress can claim any discretion. The role of the vice president should be clarified by statute. So we don't have to depend on the good faith of the vice president as we did with regard to what occurred on January 6th. So I think that there's a good deal that can be done there. I think at the state level, states should make very clear that the winner of the popular vote in the state gets the electoral votes. No legislature can change that. And also I think that they should make clear that state courts have the power to interpret 
all state laws and state constitutions, including those dealing with voting. So uh, along those lines, what is your perspective on the Electoral College? I think the Electoral College should be eliminated, but I don't think it will be. I think it should be eliminated because it's profoundly anti-democratic. I think whoever wins the popular vote should be the president of the United States. I don't see an argument that the loser of the popular vote should be able to become the president. The primary argument that's advanced is that without the Electoral College, the candidates will focus their campaigns on the most populous states and they'll ignore the smaller states. Even if it were true, I don't think that justifies why the minority should get to elect the president rather than the majority. But also, so much media is national. So much of whether it's television, radio, the internet is national. Not sure how much difference that makes. Also, the Electoral College already skews where candidates campaign. In California, as you know, we had almost no commercials for either Trump or Biden running up to the election. The same thing was true in Texas. But I'm very convinced, had we been in Georgia or Arizona or Florida or Ohio, we would have been deluged with commercials because the Electoral College made those states pivotal. So I wish there could be a constitutional amendment to eliminate the Electoral College. The problem is a constitutional amendment takes two thirds of both houses of Congress and then three fourths of the states. And there's no way that the states that benefit from the Electoral College would ever vote to eliminate it. There is a proposal that's been around for a while, the National Popular Vote Compact, where states would agree by compact to give their electoral votes to whatever candidate wins the majority of the popular vote. To this point, only so-called blue states have passed it. I don't see red states likely to do so because right now Republicans perceive they benefit from the Electoral College. But I also don't think it's enforceable. Imagine that this were a situation where Biden won the popular vote, but Trump was gonna win the electoral vote. Imagine Texas had signed the compact. Do you really believe that they would adhere to it? Or imagine a situation where the Republican won the popular vote, but the Democrat was gonna win in the electoral college. It almost happened in 2004. Do we really believe California will say, oh, we'll go along with the popular vote? There's no way to enforce something like that. So I wish we could eliminate the electoral college. I don't see a path to doing that. What is the applicable burden of proof in an impeachment trial? In other words, can the impeachment managers be held to say a clear and convincing evidence standard or is preponderance just fine? It's a great question. The constitution doesn't specify the burden of proof. It's not a criminal proceeding. I think preponderance of the evidence then should be sufficient. Perhaps a compromise would be clear and convincing evidence. Right now, ultimately, it's up to each senator to decide for himself or herself what standard of proof to require. But I don't know any reason that it shouldn't just be a preponderance of the evidence, given that there's no criminal consequences. Proof beyond a reasonable doubt seems inappropriate. Do you see the possibility of a constitutional amendment, any constitutional amendment, passing ever again? Well, there is a constitutional amendment that's been ratified by 38 states at one point or another. It's the Equal Rights Amendment. Some of those 38 states have rescinded their ratification, and there's the question of how to count them. Also, the Equal Rights Amendment initially had as a preamble that it be ratified within seven years. That was extended by three years. The 38th state to ratify the ERA was Virginia last January. And so there's a great deal of discussion among constitutional scholars, among women's rights advocates, as to whether the ERA is a part of the Constitution already or what it would take to get it there. Um, I think this is going to end up in litigation. My own conclusion is it's up to Congress, that if Congress passes a concurrent resolution that the ERA is part of the Constitution, it is. If Congress doesn't, then it won't be. 
And the basis for this is the 14th Amendment and the story of its ratification. As you might know, Congress put forth the 14th Amendment and very quickly Southern states rejected it. Congress was outraged. They saw this as an effort by the South to undo who won the Civil War. Congress passed the Reconstruction Act and created military rule over the former rebel states. Section three of the Reconstruction Act said that the Southern states could not be readmitted to the Union until they ratified the 14th Amendment. Several of them that had rejected it then under protest ratified. But meanwhile, two Northern states, New Jersey and Ohio, rescinded their ratification. Nonetheless, in July 1868, Congress passed a concurrent resolution saying three quarters of the states have now ratified, counting New Jersey and Ohio that had rescinded and counting the states that ratified under protest. And the next day, the Secretary of State Seward said it's part of the Constitution. In 1939, in Coleman versus Miller, the Supreme Court said this shows that it's entirely up to Congress to decide whether an amendment is improperly ratified. I am sure at some point there will be other amendments that will succeed. But remember, the Bill of Rights was adopted in 1791, the first 10 amendments. Since then, there have only been 17 amendments adopted since 1791. Would a, statu would a statutory requirement for proportional allocation of electoral votes of each state make the winner of the popular vote the president without eliminating the electoral college? It would tremendously decrease the likelihood that the loser of the popular vote would become the president. Right now, except in Maine and Nebraska, every state follows winner take all the winner of the popular vote gets all of the electoral votes. If you voted for Donald Trump in California in 2020, your vote didn't matter. Joe Biden got 100% of electoral votes. If you voted for Biden in Texas, your vote didn't matter. Trump got 100% of electoral votes. I've seen statistical analysis that suggests if there was proportionate allocation of the electors in every state, it would tremendously decrease the chance that the winner of the popular vote would lose in the electoral college. The difficulty with that is no state wants to practice unilateral disarmament. California, which sees itself as a blue state, doesn't want to give some of its electors to the Republican candidate if Texas, a red state, isn't gonna do so for the Democrats. And it's unclear whether Congress have the authority to force states to do proportionate allocation of the electors. But eliminating winner take all would help decrease the likelihood that the loser of the popular vote could become the president of the United States. What would have been the consequences if Congress had not certified the uh, electoral count on January 6th? Chaos. The Constitution says that the president's term ends at noon on January 20th. If no one had been certified as president or vice president, Nancy Pelosi actually would have become president because the House had already had its elections determined and the new House and Senate were sworn in on January 3rd. So if no one had been deemed president or vice president by Congress, then the Speaker of the House becomes president. But I think if Congress hadn't certified the results on January 6th and hadn't done so by January 20th, we really would have had chaos. It's hard to know what would have happened because we've never experienced it before. I don't know if it would have been like 2000, where ultimately it would have been the Supreme Court that might have decided who was the winner. Um, but you know, the Electoral College had decided on December 14th that Joe Biden was the winner. Um, should that be sufficient? Um, does Congress really have discretion to reject that? All of that might have ended up in the courts. So bottom line, I think it would have been chaos. Should the 435 limit on seats in the U.S. House be, elim be eliminated? What are your thoughts on the Wyoming rule? The result of making sure that every state has at least one seat in the House of Representatives, of course, means that 
there is a benefit for small states. Um, it's even more so, of course, in the Senate where every state gets the same representation. Any number of representatives is an arbitrary number. 435 is an arbitrary number. So would 535 be an arbitrary number? Would a house of 535 be substantially less efficient than a house of 435? Would a Senate of 104 really be any different than a Senate of 100? So I think an advantage of increasing the size of the house is you would have smaller house districts. And I think there's a democratic benefit to that. And I mean, small d, enhancing democracy. But on the other hand, you know, where's the stopping point? And there is an inefficiency to getting larger. I just don't know what's the best number for the house. Okay, great. Um, okay, and our, for our very last question, can term limits for SCOTUS be enacted without a constitutional amendment? Some scholars think so. Kermit Roosevelt, professor at the University of Pennsylvania has developed the argument and says, what you would do is they remain a justice on the Supreme Court, but they don't hear cases on the Supreme Court. They still have the title and the salary and they would hear Court of Appeals cases instead. My view is that it would take a constitutional amendment. And I think that to adopt that proposal where it's by statute means that functionally they're no longer a Supreme Court justice. So I think it would take a constitutional amendment because you're changing the life tenure of Supreme Court justices. I have hope in that I think both Republicans and Democrats favor this. Rick Perry, the Republican governor of Texas argued for 18 year non-renewable terms when he was running for president. Democrats argue for this as well. So I think there's a chance of a constitutional amendment. My major concern is to get an amendment to the constitution ratified requires that there be a constituency that really care enough to push it through. I don't know if there's such a constituency for term limits for Supreme Court justices. That was our last question, Erwin, so we're done. I wanna thank everyone for coming. Um, just so terrific that you would take your time for this. Um, thank you for all of your support for Berkeley Law. Um, I thank our development team for putting this together. And Whitney, thanks as always for reading the questions so well. <laughs>